Hey everyone, Chomix here. If you grew up with Sonic in the 2010s, this may sound like a super foreign concept. But during the 90s and 2000s, the series would see an astronomical amount of spin-off games in between major releases. These spin-offs were usually nice little bites of Sonic content that would hold fans over until the next major release. It's something we don't get so much anymore. We still occasionally get spin-off games like some of the recent mobile games or the games within the Kart Racer series, but the amount is extremely minuscule in comparison to the previous eras. The thing about these spin-offs is that they were usually created by third-party developers. They would frequently hand off the IP to completely different development teams in order to have a constant, staggered stream of new Sonic games. To put it lightly, it was pretty amazing to be a Sonic fan during those days. We'd often get multiple Sonic games released in the same year, almost every year. There was one company in particular that was responsible for a large amount of these smaller scaled spin-off games, and eventually even mainline titles as well. The developers of this company have a lot of history with Sega and Sonic Team, and it all technically started before they were even officially formed. So to get into the history, we'll have to start a little bit before this company was even founded. In 1999, the objective greatest Sonic game to ever exist began development for the Neo Geo Pocket Color, Sonic the Hedgehog Pocket Adventure. No joke, this game literally has a perfect 10 out of 10 rating on IGN. It's a masterpiece. I guess all of our opinions about what Sonic game is the best are all invalid. Read and weep everyone, time to pack it up and go home. The game was developed by SNK, with the supervision of Sonic Team, and released the same year it began development. Sonic Pocket Adventure was a classic style 2D Sonic game, but with the art style of the, at the time, new modern Sonic redesign. For its time, it was really impressive stuff, being able to fit a classic Sonic game on a handheld for the first time well. Emphasis on well. Up until that point, we'd only ever seen shoddy attempts at portable Sonic games on the Game Gear. Some of them are pretty decent, but the extremely limiting hardware could never allow for some of the more advanced physics fans would come to enjoy from the console classics. After the release of Sonic Pocket Adventure, several key developers from SNK and even Capcom went on to form their own company in 2001 called Dimps. Little did they know when creating Pocket Adventure, they were beginning the start of an extremely important relationship with Sega and Sonic Team. Dimps would go on to create a lot of Sonic games for handheld consoles like the Game Boy Advance and Nintendo DS in the early 2000s. But besides Sonic games, Dimps is also responsible for creating games for other franchises like Dragon Ball. Another obscure parallel between Sonic and Dragon Ball, I probably could have mentioned in my Sonic and Dragon Ball Obscure Parallels video. You should go check that out if you haven't by the way. Their first game they ever developed as a newly formed company was Sonic Advance 1 on the Game Boy Advance in 2001. Very similar to Pocket Adventure, it was a 2D Sonic game, playing pretty similar to the original trilogy, but with the extra pizzazz of the art style and certain gameplay elements from the Sonic Adventure series. You were able to play as Sonic, Tails, Knuckles, and Amy, each with their own unique abilities. It's a full-fledged Sonic game on handheld, and it does what it does very decently. The step up from the Neo Geo Pocket Color to the Game Boy Advance is huge. This game is beautiful looking, even for today's standards. The sprite art is extremely detailed and very animated. It captures the Sonic Adventure art style in pixel form perfectly. In 2002, the sequel to the first Sonic Advance game was released. Sonic Advance 2 took pretty much everything from Advance 1, but built it up. It shared a lot of the same sprite art and characters with their abilities of the first game. On top of this, they added a completely new member to the roster of playable characters, Cream the Rabbit. There's also several new mechanics like the ability to break the sound barrier by reaching extremely high speeds. For the most part, Advance 2 does what a sequel should do. Take all the cool stuff from the first game and just add on top of it. Just like Advance 1, its sequel is extremely stylish, maybe even more so. It reuses most of the character's sprite art, besides Cream the Rabbit obviously, but also just adds on top of it with even more animations and special effects. The levels are all more vibrant, and overall the game is just visually a step up from the first. The final game in the Sonic Advance trilogy, Sonic Advance 3, was released in 2004 for, surprise, the Game Boy Advance. Big shocker, I know. 
Advance 3 was very ambitious. There are 5 characters just like in the previous game, but here's the kick. You can pair any two characters up into a team to give them a completely unique team move depending on the pairing. This game also opted to use a hub world instead of the level select menu, unlike the first two games. I've always been a fan of hub worlds in Sonic games, as they make the game feel more exploration based. Once again, Sonic Advance 3 just takes a lot of what was going on in the first two games and then adds on to them. Without going beyond a brief brief explanation of the game, there isn't really too much else to detail here. It's just more of the same stuff you've come to love. For their next game, Dimps would start the development on their next series of portable Sonic games for the Nintendo DS. In 2005, Sonic Rush was released, another 2D side-scroller styled game that utilized both the top and the bottom screen of the Nintendo DS in pretty interesting ways. Despite being only limited to two dimensions of gameplay, character models were in 3D. This was also Blaze the Cat's debut to the series, and she would be the second playable character besides Sonic himself. The gameplay is pretty close to what you'd come to expect from a 2D Sonic game, but with an added feature, the boost. Yep, Sonic Rush was the first game to really utilize the boost mechanic we've come to know from the boost style games like Sonic Unleashed. Characters have a boost meter which fills up after destroying enemies and doing tricks, very similar to how it works in the boost games. One of my favorite aspects of this game is the soundtrack composed by the legendary Twitter meme man himself, Hideki Naganuma. If you don't know, he also composed a lot of the soundtrack for Jet Set Radio, a series that I absolutely adore and will probably make a video on eventually. Just give a listen to a few samples from his tracks in the game. In 2007, Dimps would release Sonic Rush Adventure, a sequel to Sonic Rush. Again, players take control of both Sonic and Blaze, with gameplay being extremely similar to the first game. Sonic Rush Adventure is basically just a continuation to the story and levels of the previous entry. There really isn't too much else to say about this one, other than the unfortunate fact that Hideki Naganuma wasn't able to compose for the soundtrack this time. Oh, we got jet skis, baby! Let's go! At this point, Dimps was able to prove themselves to be extremely competent at making Sonic games in the eyes of Sega and Sonic Team. They would be trusted to assist in creating the alternate, usually lower caliber hardware versions of mainline Sonic games. In 2008, Sonic Unleashed was released on the Xbox 360 and PS3, but also the PS2 and Wii. The 360 and PS3 versions are actually completely different games than the PS2 and Wii versions. For this game's development, Sonic Team split up into two divisions to work on the two different versions of this game. The previous gen version of this game's development was heavily assisted by Dimps, who were responsible for helping with the daytime stages. While they played more of a helping hand role in this game, it's still interesting to see how Sega and Sonic Team started to utilize Dimps for their mainline titles. This co-developer role would continue into the 2010s with Sonic the Hedgehog 4 Episodes 1 and 2, releasing in 2010 and 2012, respectively. Dimps and Sonic Team would once again team up to create more mainline titles for the series. Being a 2D style game, Dimps had a lot of experience of course with the Sonic Advance series as well as the Sonic Rush series all within the previous decade. They were the perfect dev team to co-develop a game in this style. But unfortunately, Sonic 4 Episode 1 and 2's execution felt a bit flat, especially when compared to the smaller spin-off titles that came before. Even with the dream team of Dimps and Sonic Team trying their hand at one of the first mainline 2D games in a long time, it tragically didn't live up to the hype as much as fans were expecting. It's unclear if it was due to the failure of Sonic 4, or if Sega just wanted it this way, but Dimps would return to create handheld titles released in conjunction with mainline titles of the same name. In 2010, Sonic Colors released on the Wii and DS, the former being completely developed by Sonic Team and the latter by Dimps. These games share similar stories, themes, and certain gameplay mechanics, but the main difference is that the Wii version plays in the boost style of gameplay, 
while the DS version plays in the Rush style of gameplay. A lot of people consider the DS version of Sonic Colors to be the spiritual Sonic Rush 3. Another important difference lies within the story. Interestingly, the DS versions include cameos from a ton of other characters that aren't in the Wii version like Knuckles, Silver, Shadow, Team Chaotix, and several others. I always thought this was super cool and wish that the Wii version was also set up like this. I actually haven't played this game all the way through, but I think I might have actually liked the story of Sonic Colors a lot more if I were to have played this version of the game instead. Dimps would continue to create handheld versions of mainline titles. Sonic Generations was released on the Xbox 360, PS3, PC, and 3DS in 2011. The 3DS version was created by Dimps, and again has some super interesting differences compared to its console counterpart. I'd actually go as far as to argue that the 3DS version of Sonic Generations is a completely different, complementary game. It's got a similar premise with the two styles of gameplay with modern and classic Sonic, but the levels you traverse aren't only different in design, but are almost all completely unique in setting. In the 3DS version of Generations, we get to visit stages from past Sonic games that aren't in the console version like Casino Night, Mushroom Hill, Emerald Coast, Radical Highway, Water Palace, and Tropical Resort. Unfortunately, in 2013, Dimps would go on to create their last Sonic game, with Sonic Lost World on the 3DS. Similar to the DS version of Sonic Colors, the 3DS version of Lost World follows the story of its console counterpart very closely, while having some minor differences in execution. This goes for the gameplay as well. The level settings are very similar, but the layouts and level design are completely different. Sonic Lost World on the 3DS is very unique, as it's the first and unfortunately last completely 3D handheld Sonic games Dimps was able to create. Now with all the history of Sonic games under Dimps' belt out of the way, I want to go deeper into some of the key characteristics of their level design and gameplay philosophies. First of all, we need to address some of the awkward and unfair level design decisions they often make. Dimps' level designs can be very unforgiving. There's a lot of instances of obstacles being unintuitively placed that just completely stop all momentum. But to be fair, a lot of these issues kind of come from the fact that most of their games aren't in widescreen. So having a much narrower view of the levels makes it a lot more difficult to react to certain obstacles. It's an unfortunate side effect of the hardware that really can't be helped, so it's kind of difficult to blame them for this. But one thing I absolutely can blame them for is their overuse of bottomless pits. It's kind of a long-running joke among many of the players who have endured Dimps' questionable level design, but they absolutely love using bottomless pits as a way to express difficulty. It almost always feels really unfair when dying to them, and especially in Sonic Advance 2, they are utterly rampant. Another trademark of their gameplay philosophy is their ridiculously difficult special stages. I think Sonic Advance 2 is by far the worst offender, because getting all 7 Chaos Emeralds is such a strenuous task that I usually don't even bother. It requires collecting all 7 hidden rings and finishing the level in a single go without dying, just to have a chance at getting the Chaos Emerald. It means the player needs to have complete knowledge of the level layout on top of being skilled enough to grab each ring, as they're usually placed in very difficult to reach locations. It's extremely painstaking and honestly has no business being this brutal. In addition, the special stages themselves can be extremely difficult, so if you fail, it means you have to do the entire process of getting to it all over again. The special stages in most other of their games aren't nearly as bad, but still very difficult when compared to the special stages from other mainline Sonic games. Man, this is kind of just turned into me ranting about Sonic Advance 2 at this point. I still like this game for its sense of style and speed, but holy crap, this game just gives me war flashbacks. Why are we still here? Just to suffer? The body I've lost. The comrades I've lost. Won't stop hurting. The final, and an actual fun little detail I want to point out, 
is Dimps' obsession with giving their first bosses hammers. Seriously, the first boss in every Sonic Advance game uses a hammer, or is literally a hammer. They eventually stopped using this trope later on, but it's something I always noticed ever since playing the original Advance trilogy. It might just be a hilarious coincidence, or it's totally possible one of the developers has an irrational hatred towards hammers and needed to use the games as a way to take out his pent-up aggression towards them. I guess we'll never know. So what happened to Dimps? Their last game was Sonic Lost World for the 3DS. They still create games for other IPs, but they haven't done a Sonic game ever since. So here's my theory. I personally think the Nintendo Switch killed their entire career in Sonic games. Think about it. The Nintendo Switch is both a console and a handheld gaming device. For most of Dimps' career with Sonic, they would create games for handheld devices like the Game Boy Advance, the Nintendo DS, and the 3DS, which were all considerably weaker devices than their console counterparts. This required Sega to create an entirely separate version of their game if they wanted it to be on handhelds. But the Nintendo Switch has since blurred the line between console and handheld gaming. Now, if Sega wants a Sonic game on handheld, they can just have it ported to the Switch. It no longer requires a completely separate development of a Sonic game in order to work on handheld. Look no further than Sonic Forces. It was released on pretty much every major platform, including the Nintendo Switch. With the Switch alone, it covers both bases of console and handheld markets. So what about the future? Do I think Dimps could possibly return to co-develop a Sonic game in the future? I don't think it's impossible, but it's definitely still a pretty narrow chance. Especially with Sonic Team stating how they plan to take more time with their games from now on, it seems like the need for Dimps' assistance might be finished. Unless there's some big change in Sega and Sonic Team's philosophy of releasing games, I'm pretty pessimistic about Dimps making a return anytime soon. As I mentioned earlier in this video, we really don't get as many Sonic spin-off games as we used to compared to the 90s and 2000s. Personally, I'd love for this to change. The spin-off games were perfect for scratching that itch for new Sonic games in between major releases. I think if Sega ever decides to go all in on Sonic games again, they should definitely consider using Dimps to co-develop for them. With the more advanced technology we have nowadays, they'd be able to create full-fledged projects even on handhelds. I'd personally be really interested to see more spin-off games created by Dimps again. They have a lot of experience under their belt for developing for Sonic, so it's a shame that their talents aren't being put to use. It's the perfect way to keep Sonic Team's main developers in a single team, creating mainline titles, while also giving us more content in between. I think it really is a win-win for everyone. Hey everyone, thank you so much for making it to the end of this video. If you like what you saw, smash that like button and subscribe for more content similar to this. It really, really helps smaller channels like me get noticed on YouTube. I stream every Wednesday and Sunday on Twitch, so stop by if you'd like to see me play some games. In the comments section, let me know your favorite Dimps title. Personally, I think mine is Sonic Rush. And finally, if you're a super fan of Chomix or just like discussing Sonic, make sure to join the community Discord. Links to everything in the description. And as always, I hope everyone has a fantastic day. Peace.